Welcome to the Purely Podcast. I'm your host, Alicia Pope, health coach, wellness expert. You can consider me your online bestie too. Imagine we're having a green juice together or a glass of wine for that matter. I believe in wellness that empowers you and lifts you up. On this podcast, you can expect a 360 degree view of wellness. But remember, there's no perfect when it comes to our health. It's whatever works for us. With that, let's dive in. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Purely Podcast. This is your host, Alicia Pope, and I'm really excited for today's episode because we are chatting more about finance and financial well-being. We first chatted about this on episode 42 with Danny Pascarella, who is the founder of 111, which is a budgeting app and spending plan app, as Danny said. And now today we are talking with Joy Solingi, who is the co-founder of Investera.io, which is a platform that is dedicated to educating women on the power of investing and and just really helping them gain financial intelligence. So we talked about the spending and budgeting on episode 42, and now we're really diving deep into the investing piece and how you can make your money work for you. So financial well-being, as I've talked about before, is a huge piece of our overall health and wellness because as I'm sure a lot of you know, or maybe know from experience, if you have any sort of financial stress, then that can lead to so many other problems in our lives. And also just being very blunt about it too. I think financial well-being also allows us to take care of ourselves better, right? So just learning about this and educating ourselves is so, so huge. So to introduce you to Joy, as I mentioned, she is the co-founder of Investera, an investment education community, supporting women in building financial intelligence across asset classes from stocks to cryptocurrency. Joy is passionate about economic empowerment and financial inclusion. She contributed to systems design and business development for a top tier global crypto asset exchange. Prior to that, she spent a decade serving the underbanked in over 20 countries as the director of operations for an impact bank, helping low-income entrepreneurs get access to capital. And as I mentioned, Investera is a community designed with an edge in digital assets. So you can take care of your financial well-being. So before diving into the episode, I would love to give you my health coaching tip of the day. And that is to go check out Investera. Honestly, it is a community and you can actually join now. So you can see that link in the show notes. And I think it is so powerful to just begin to educate yourself. For so long, I ignored the topic of finance. I ignored the topic of investing. And the earlier you can do it, the better and the better you are going to be set up to take care of yourself for the long run. And Joy is really, really great in this episode at educating us so much on this topic. So I'm really excited for you to hear it and I can't wait to hear what you think about it. So without further ado, please help me welcome Joy Saligny of Investera to the Purely Podcast. Hi Joy, how are you? Doing well. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited to chat with you and dive deeper into what you do. So I would love to start off for you to tell everybody a little bit about your background and how you got to what you're doing today in the finance world and being a co-founder of an amazing new platform. Sure. So I am the co-founder of Investera. We're an investment education community that's helping take people from the place of saying, you know, I'm not an investor or like I don't feel confident investing to crossing the bridge to saying I am an investor, I have an investment plan, and I feel confident about my financial future. And I come to that space from my background is in financial inclusion. And what I mean by that is I worked in developing countries with providing um, access to capital to entrepreneurs in that were largely underbanked. Um, so in pretty challenging environments. And I did that for 10 years. And I'm really, really passionate. I've always been about people achieving their full economic potential. And I really think it's a matter of like people not having the access to resources and know how to unlock that often. So however that can be provided, whether it's doing that in developing countries or 
now with helping people support people through our education community and building their financial intelligence so that they can develop that confidence. I love that. And I love how there's a big focus on this economic empowerment and financial inclusion and in all of the work that you do. I'm curious, was there a moment or a situation that made you realize like how much equality is in that space? Because it's kind of something that comes from, oh, okay, well, if you grow up and your parents have money and your parents know how to invest, then they're going to learn. And it kind of stays that way within our culture and our society. So was there a certain moment or something that was almost like an aha moment for you? Or was it kind of just a learning over time of just seeing common themes? Yeah, so I was born um, abroad. I am a U.S. citizen, but I was born in Guatemala. Then I lived in Venezuela and I moved to U.S. probably when I was like nine. And so I personally experienced and witnessed certain economic injustices in those environments from a really young age. And when I moved to the U.S., I had a lot of questions about the differences that I saw. And um, I would say I've carried that throughout my life, and it's part of the reason why I went into doing the work I did in microfinance um, for 10 years. And so I've always been curious about where people are, how they got there. And then I myself, too, um, started working like at a very young age and um, and realizing that we don't learn these things in schools like we don't get a toolkit for um, how to manage our finances how to the basics of investing and how to grow and preserve wealth and then how we can use that too to benefit our communities. So it was just, I would say there was aha moments all along my journey, but just realizing that there are those who somehow get this knowledge at some point, often not in school. And then there's the majority of the world that does not um, receive that kind of financial intelligence. And so I'm really, really passionate about making it accessible to as many people as possible. Yeah. Had you always been financially literate or was it something that your parents kind of chatted with you about when you kind of had those questions when you moved to the U.S. from from Venezuela and when you kind of saw those differences there? Or was it something was it something you were always super curious about or was it just kind of developed along the way or what? how did that work out? And like also, too, like, have you always been financially literate? Was it something that was talked about a lot in your household? It was not. No, I, I wish it had been. <laughs> it was not. And I got into the field of financial um, well-being and being in a space where I was working with financial literacy in developing countries. And I realized in my own backyard um, in the U.S. and in my own home, like it wasn't talking about that. And even though I was helping others with their businesses and growing like outside of my own 401k, I wasn't doing much. And so I remember I was kind of quiet about it because there's a lot of um, stigma and shame around talking about money. And I was like, I think I'm supposed to have this figured out. <laughs> and I think a lot of people feel that way. Um, and I, I don't know how we would if we don't learn about it in schools. And so I remember at one point in early on in my career, I took a bunch of people that I looked up to that um, were in C-suite positions, CEOs, COOs, CFOs to ask them about their investment journeys because I wanted to grow in mine. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to be vulnerable and say, I really would like to learn. I don't know really quite where to start and who to trust. And to my surprise, um, the majority of them were, you know, expressed regret that they hadn't started sooner if they were investing or they didn't have like a investment plan aside of their like retirement accounts. And so that, that was a big aha for me of like, especially with women, of like what's going on here why is there's this gap that exists like women are statistically less likely to invest than men and sit on their wealth in a savings account rather than having it work make money for them and so i started digging into that and i was like what's going on here and they're just there's so many gaps and so many stereotypes around women and money and not being good with money and and they're untrue like <laughs> so yeah i would i it would i taught it was self taught journey and i'm passionate about it not having to be a self taught journey like creating community where you can learn from each other share information and experiences yeah i love that you brought that up how especially amongst women i think that there have always been a lot of 
taboos and stereotypes around women with money. And why do you think it is so rare amongst women? Like, I know, obviously you were mentioning that we don't learn about it in school, but it's like, neither do the men, you know what I mean? Like the men don't learn about it in school unless they go and become finance majors in college, which a lot of men do. I'm sure if you look at like the, who are finance majors in colleges and things like that, I'm sure that would be statistically more men as well. But why do you think that is? Do you think it's just because of our society, like how we have developed as a society where it's like women didn't necessarily need to know that back in the day or something like that. And it's just casually and, and gradually breaking down that stereotype and kind of really implementing that knowledge with women now. Yes, I think societal conditioning has a big part to do with it. And uh, the roles, I mean, you look back to the 1950s and what were the glorified roles of the man and the woman in the home. And now that's changing, right? And in fact, most people aren't aware that women are stepping into greater wealth than ever before. And in the US already, women actually um, have the majority of personal wealth in their hands. It's, I think, around 66%. And so there is this incredible opportunity for, for women, and it's it's not just the U.S. It's shifting. And if you think about it, it makes sense. We are now we've stepped into the workforce. We're outliving our spouses, so we're inheriting that money. Maybe inheriting our parents' money, and and women are actually really good with their money when they put their mind to it. And studies show repeatedly often outperform men. And again, like you said, it's really not about gender. And so that's where somehow at some point society typecasted that men take care of the money um, and investing, even though most often women were actually controlling the purse strings in the house and managing the budgets and all of that. And, and that's finally being disrupted. So we're looking at two, we're like, okay, now that women are stuck in the majority of the wealth, what can they do with that and get smart with it? Because money can be such a power for good too. So we're really passionate about helping people invest in a way that aligns with their values. So yeah, I think it was a lot of societal conditioning, a lot of narratives and stories. There's these um, myths around uh, like, you know, I, I have to be good at math to be able to invest or that it takes a lot of time or that it requires a lot of money up front. And those are all myths. That's awesome. Yeah, I think you're right. And that I love those facts that you were saying about how women actually are, you know, statistically getting up there on the chart and when it comes to investing. So in regards to investing, I would love for you to tell everybody why we should be investing our money versus just keeping it in the bank. In the olden days too, we were just talking about the 50s where it's like, oh, you would hide the money under yeah. your a couch or in a floorboard or something like that. So what is the benefit of having that money invested versus keeping it in the bank? So we work with um, a lot of women who are credible entrepreneurs and have grown significant assets. And a lot of them are sitting on it in a savings account. And when you put your money in a savings account, you are making, if you're lucky, and if it's in a high yield savings account, you might be making one, maybe 2% when the economy is doing well. Um, but that's not enough to um, deal with inflation. So right now we're seeing unprecedented levels of inflation. The most we've seen in our lifetime, we're at seven and a half percent. And and I just, just for your listeners, what that means is when they say like inflation is 7.5%, that means the cost of goods from exactly a year ago compared to today is now seven and a half percent higher. That's why when we go to go get a coffee, we go to fill up our gas tank, like all of a sudden it's taking more of our money to do the exact same things. So when you put your money in a savings account and you feel, even if you're making that minimal and, and if it's not a high yield savings account, it's like 0 0.00, it's nothing. You're actually losing money to inflation over time. It's ero eroding your purchasing power. Whereas if you, our recommendation is set aside your emergency fund in a high yield savings account, and then beyond that, anything beyond that, invest it and have it make money for you. And if you look at, you know, market performance, if you're going into, let's say the S&P 500 with traditional stocks, on average, if you look over the last hundred years, that has generated like 10% a year. So right there, you're already starting to beat inflation. And then as you get more comfortable investing and you go into different assets, especially digital assets like cryptocurrency, 
there's much more higher yields to be made. Um, and we recommend, you know, diversifying across all asset classes. But the biggest reason is to not just preserve, but grow your wealth and not lose to inflation. And what you want to do is get to a point where when you are ready to retire, your money is making enough money to cover your cost of living. And um, when we talk to women, the story over and over is like the avoidance of looking at what their net worth is and the future. And do I have enough to cover the future? Because I think there's just a lot of fear there. And um, worldwide, that resonates like 90% plus of women feel financially insecure about their future. And so, yeah, we want to challenge that because we're like, okay, no, you're stepping into greater wealth than ever before. This is within your control, taking financial control and designing your life. Like that's what money does is you can design your life on your terms and not be dependent on other people or other, you know, or government entities. Which is so empowering. And I love that you are educating people on that because I think education and knowledge is power, especially when it comes it is, to yeah. finance and, and understanding the nuances of all of it. So before we dive into the different types of investments and what you would recommend and kind of the differences between all of it, because I think that can be really overwhelming. I would love, you mentioned something about an emergency fund and having that in a high yield savings account. So what would you recommend in terms of what you have liquid? So money or cash you have accessible to you in your bank account versus how much is going into investments. Is that a case by case basis? Is there some sort of, you know, standard of percentage that people should plan for? Because I think sometimes that is a little bit of a gray area that people maybe aren't sure about either. Yeah. So you'll hear a lot of different perspectives on this and what we encourage people to think about because everyone's situation is unique is looking at what your cost of living is on a monthly basis. And so that you can take that and then choose how many months you would feel good about having covered in the case of an emergency scenario. So there'll be people who recommend up to a year, you know, we generally say three to six months. It also depends. Do you have um, a partner or family member that could help out? If you don't, then you might extend that even longer. Right. And and so that if you were to lose your job or have a medical emergency, that you have the means to cover your needs during that time. And that provides that financial peace of mind. Um, and so, yeah, generally we suggest three to six months of your cost of living and then putting that in a high yield savings account. So it's generating for you. But everyone's different. Some people have less. It's all different. It depends on what kind of safety nets you have available to you as well. Let's take a minute to talk about my ride or die for digestive and gut health, and that is Seed Symbiotic. If you're wondering what a symbiotic is, it is both a pre and probiotic in one amazing little pill. But actually, I take two a day on an empty stomach every single morning, and trust me, I notice when I don't take it. It combines 24 clinically studied probiotic strains that are not found in yogurt, most supplements, or fermented foods and beverages. Not only does a symbiotic benefit and improve our digestive health, but it also expands out into heart health, skin health, immunity, and better nutrient absorption. Seed not only adheres to FDA guidelines, but also all supplement guidelines globally. Seed has an on-staff scientific advisory board, and they're always staying on top of the science and are 100% transparent in sharing all the research on their product and prove efficacy. Seed ensures that all affiliates, such as myself, are educated and go through seed university to spread science and facts rather than false claims and promotes hashtag accountable influence. You can even test your knowledge on their website through a fun little quiz. Another thing to note about seed is that most probiotics don't even survive the trip to your gut, which is just wild. Seed obviously does, and you can actually get the benefits from the symbiotic that way. Another really cool thing about Seed is that they care about the earth. You'll receive one glass jar and then all of your refills come in recycled paper packaging and you so you get to be sustainable and healthy. It is a win-win. So as I mentioned, I take two pills every morning on an empty stomach. I absolutely love it. Seed is free of dairy, gluten, soy, GMOs, binders, fillers, preservatives, 14 classes of allergens defined by the European Food and Safety Authority. So if you want to try out seed for yourself, you can use code ALICIA15, that is A-L-Y-S-I-A, 
one five for 15% off your first month of seed. If you have any other questions, let me know, but you can also find the link in the show notes. If you want to try out seed for yourself, I promise you, you won't be disappointed and your gut will definitely thank you with that. Let's get back to the show. And in regards to finding a high yield savings account, are there specific banks that offer that? Or is that something where people can ask, you know, whatever, wherever their checking account is, oh, can I open a high yield savings account with you? Or do you have any recommendations there? Yes. So traditionally, um, the brick and mortar institutions we're used to, and by brick and mortar, I mean being able to go visit and see someone in a building, in a bank, those often don't offer high yield savings account. It's often the online ones that do like Amex has a great high yield savings account. Um, So just you can Google high yield savings account and you'll see that right now, um, because of the economic situation, the rates are a bit lower. It'll be maybe 0.5% up to 1%, but way higher than, let's say, a Wells Fargo um, or a Citibank doing 0.001. And something I want to point out, too, to like your listeners, we often don't think about what the banks are doing with our money. It does not sit in an account, and it's not just sitting there. They are lending and leveraging that money and borrowing it out, investing it many times over. So, you know, I... I could definitely get frustrated knowing how much is being made off of what's just sitting in the accounts. And that's when I get excited about like the world of digital assets provides opportunity for you to lend out your own money and make more money like the banks do. Yeah. That's a really good point. And kind of thinking yeah. of it in that way of, okay, well, you're making money off my money. Why shouldn't I Same make money, money off my money <laughs> instead exactly. of this yeah. big like institution. Yeah. So that's a really and, good point. And also point. asking and, what they're doing with your money and if it aligns in a way that with your values. So um, the ESG movement, environmental social governance movement came into investing into the forefront really in like 2019. It was really driven by women and millennials. Um, before that, people weren't asking their banks, what are you actually investing in? And does it align with my values? I'm so relieved that that's changing. And I encourage people to ask their financial institutions. And the narrative has definitely changed. A couple of years ago, when I was asking that question, banks would be like, oh, you know, um, we're considering investing in ESG portfolios and we might have some options available to you in the future. But, you know, those don't perform as well as traditional. And, and the traditional, like, have no exclusions or investing in fossil fuels, weapons, all these things. And what's really cool is that has changed now. And I think it was 2020 that ESG portfolios actually outperformed traditional, which makes me so excited. Like we're all, that's another myth we had to bust and prove. And it was just because it had, they hadn't had enough time to show performance and traction. So yeah, there's so many questions that are good to ask and not make assumptions about what's being done with your money and know that you can have influence over what even your institution is doing with your money. Yeah. Wow. See, I didn't even know you could ask that question of like, where yeah. are you investing and, this money? And if they don't care to answer it, move your money. Like that's a powerful vote. And I know it can take a little bit of pain, but when we've helped and facilitate women making those moves, it's just such an empowering thing. And, you know, you're investing more in a way that lines with value and you're making more. It's a win-win. Completely. Yeah. So let's get into breaking down the different types of investments. So number one, I think the most common ones that people know about or are investing in already are probably like 401k, Roth IRA. So can you maybe just describe those quickly to anybody so that they can understand them more and also kind of differentiate between the two? And then we can dive into other investments too. Yeah. So um, I would zoom out a little bit and like, when you talk about investing, you talk about assets. And at the end of the day, assets is really anything you put your money into that can make money for you. And when we speak about traditional assets, it's often equities, which are stocks um, for the most part. And with stocks, you, you're investing, taking a share in a company and the performance of the company hopefully does well. And then you benefit as the company grows, um, you're a stakeholder in that company. And you can choose to get access to stocks through different vehicles. Um, And what you mentioned, like a 401k or IRA, those are just a a form, a vehicle where you have the stocks that you're holding. Um, And those are ones that are retirement um, vehicles and have tax advantages. So 401k is often through your company. Um, IRA is an individual retirement account. There are different versions of that, and you can do that whether through your company or on your own. 
And then there's max amounts you can contribute because they are tax advantage. And so we encourage people after your like emergency thing, max out your retirement accounts, and then you can go into general investing beyond that. Got it. Okay. And a yeah. lot of times the employer might do a match or something with the 401k yes. and, and that too, like people should really take advantage of as well, especially if the out. employer. Yeah. yeah. That's free okay. money right there. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So then the, the crazy wild, wild world of the stock market, <laughs> I know that you were talking about that. What would you recommend maybe like the best platforms to use to invest in this? How do you recommend if somebody is coming at this for like, I, the only thing I've ever done is just choose my 401k thing on my pay stub when I got my job, how would you explain it to them? And how would you explain them getting involved in investing in the stock market? So one thing that I do, a myth I want to bust is like that there's often this perception like, oh, I have to be active in this. Like on people, we see people on their phones, like trading and checking the stock market every day. And like, that's overwhelming. And that's actually not for most people. And a lot of people more often not lose money doing that, being actively involved. So it's better to take a strategy where you set your long-term objectives and you hold and you kind of set it and forget it. And if you're new to the market, um, robo advisors are great to use and they are low cost compared to having um, an actively managed portfolio and i can't get into it all on this but we go into this in our community and break it all down and you know which platforms are best but there are easy to use platforms where it takes a little bit of work up front to set things up but not that much and then you just have set up a reoccurring deposit to get access to the markets and you don't have to do all the picking so you go into like an index fund, which is a basket of funds that's well, stocks that's well diversified. Got it. So would that be like a Vanguard or Fidelity or those sorts of platforms where people are setting up, you know, kind of a choosing the low stock and or the low index funds or whatever you just said? I'm like, Yeah, what, those are those are platforms. And we really love to like Betterment, for example, it's a great robo advisory platform. And you can, they I think can manage it for 0.25%. And also, if you are doing it through your employer, I would ask um, how much it's the cost is being to be managed. So while you're not paying them outright, they're taking it out of your portfolio. And like if it's above, you can get it below 1%, like I said, with Betterment. And so some people are paying 2 to 3% a year. They don't even know it because it's just automatically being deducted from their investment portfolio. And that's too high in this day and age. Got it. Okay. That's yeah. good to know too. And a good question for people to look at and, and explore mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And within the stock market, there's a bunch of different options, you know, like the individual stocks, S&P 500, mutual funds. Would you recommend, like for somebody that is a new investor, would you recommend that they learn about each of those different options? Or would you just recommend, like you were saying, really just kind of choosing something within one of those platforms that, that works for them and not necessarily realizing or, or worrying about those differentiations? Yeah, I think as a, as a newbie, I would recommend um, understanding the different offerings that like a robo advisor has and then choosing from there because it does take time to dive in and it's not necessary to do that and to do individual picking and that normally doesn't play out that well you want to be well diversified so yeah we have a whole um workshop called learn the language of investing that does break down again it takes time but it's not rocket science um the terminology can feel a little bit like learning a new language but once you get it it kind of clicks in Amazing. That's great that you have a workshop yeah. on that. So if anybody wants to yeah. dive deeper. Yeah. So then another type of investment, which digital assets. So cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, NFTs, would love to hear your thoughts on all of this because I think it is also all the rage right now. And I think it's something too that people are like, oh my gosh, I need to get into this right away because mm. I need to make money really quick. And you know, there's almost like this like anxiety and stress around it as well. Like, oh my gosh, I need to get there, like a FOMO sort of thing. So yeah, can you totally explain <laughs> just what these are, how to get involved, or maybe you don't recommend getting involved for somebody that might be like a new investor too? Yeah, there's a lot of hype. And I would say it's not too late. And this is not a passing trend or fad. There are within the world of digital assets, a lot of things that aren't going to shake out, just like we saw with the dot-com bubble and with the internet. But um, like Bitcoin just celebrated its 13th birthday. That is the, the leading cryptocurrency. 
Um, and when we talk about, let me rewind a little bit. When we talk about digital assets, we're referring basically to um, yeah, cryptocurrency, NFTs, and that's supported by the blockchain. So in its simplest terms, um, cryptocurrency is a digital form of money that say kind of lives on a network of computers that are secure. And, and that might sound a little out there, um, but once you start like studying it, it, it makes sense. And these computers that are verifying all the transaction record um, these transactions on a ledger, and that's the blockchain, the supporting technology behind it. Um, and what I would encourage people to remember is to think about the historical evolution of money to kind of get the historical context of this and what you know currency is. Um, the U.S. dollar, the fiat, which is the paper money that we're familiar with, um, that that's only been around for three hundred years. And if you zoom out beyond that, like we used to trade seashells and then we traded like tobacco, we traded metals, um, like gold, silver. Then we moved to the paper money about 300 years ago. And that's called fiat. So that's something, another term to remember. And then we started moving to plastic, like debit cards and digital and the digitization. So this is just the next step. We're stepping into a digital era. Um, so I encourage people to not shy away from this and to get curious because this is here to stay. Now, what exactly will stay is still to be determined. There's a lot of noise in the space, and that's why we also created this community was to distill the noise and um, filter all the hype out, because there is so much. There's over 5,000 cryptocurrencies now. <laughs> um, and you don't, one thing or two, you don't need to understand the technology fully. So I point to often that how we use the internet every day to communicate, to run our lives, our businesses, and how many of us can explain the internet to someone exactly how it works, right? And yet we trust it and we use it. Well, blockchain and cryptocurrency, this is the next evolution and it's happening. Um, so my co-founder Mel has been in the space, gosh, um, since early days. I got into it after I was working in traditional finance, as I was mentioning before, and I was running into a lot of obstacles in the work I was doing. The traditional financial system, it's slow, it's costly, um, and it was really frustrating trying to do good in these environments where I was trying to give small amounts, for example, to low-income entrepreneurs in countries like Haiti, Afghanistan. Sometimes it costs more to facilitate that transaction than the actual amount I was trying to send. And cryptocurrency solves that. Um, it's a way of being able to exchange peer to peer value and not have middle hands involved. So when I said it was on like a network of computers today, if you look how money is moved, there are so many players, central banks, treasuries, third party providers. It's not just your bank. Then you have payment platforms and they all have to talk to each other and there's fees involved in all of it. Um, cryptocurrency and blockchain removes a lot of the hands that touch and the fees. So it makes things simpler. So I know a lot of people, when they hear about it, they just hear about investment hype and making a ton of money. Like I personally am passionate about it from the different, there's so many different use cases from a financial inclusion a human rights. There's so many, we go into this in our Bitcoin for beginners workshop, um, but the possibilities are really exciting and it is a new monetary system and it is shaping, evolving. And I'm also really excited to get more women involved in it, not only as investors, but um, as contributors and leaders. So if any of your listeners are curious about working in the field of digital assets, I have channels I can plug them into. My co-founder Mel and I advised a crypto exchange last year for about a year and learned a lot about centralized exchanges. Now we're looking at decentralized exchanges. So I know these are a lot of big words that are out there, but I think the point I want to get across is you don't have to understand it all to get involved and know that this is like here to stay and also that there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of scams in the space. So do find a trusted community. If it's not Investera, find another one. There's not that many out there though, I'll tell you, which is why we created this um, because you, you do want to be smart and you want to be responsible with how you engage in that space. It's so new.
Got it. Amazing. Sorry, that was a lot. I get really excited. (laughs) Honestly, that was really, that was really eye-opening for me even. I mean, I understand it so much more now too. So is there a platform or an app or something where people, I know obviously they're going to come to Investera to learn more about all of this, but similar to how we were talking about like the stock market and and investing there, like you were saying, you know, um, the Betterment or the Vanguards of the world, is there a platform like that that is dedicated to cryptocurrency where people can actually get on there and start like investing money in cryptocurrency too. Yes. And Mel and I are hoping to to build one. That's the next project we're working on. That's Um, exciting. Right now. Yeah. um, Great ones and Coinbase. The fees are a little high, but it's um, a simple, it's for beginners. It works really well. You can just start playing with small amounts. Um, Swan is another one. It, it only allows for Bitcoin, but um, it has the lowest fees. And so I would encourage maybe people just to start with that and playing with that and doing small amounts over time. And it's just important to get started and get your skin in the game, get comfortable with the technology, get comfortable with the volatility. There's a lot of volatility in the space. That means like the ups and downs. Um, and we talk about these, these things in our community. Amazing. Yeah. And then really quickly, can you tell us what NFTs are? NFTs. Um, so NFT stands for non-fudgeable token. I feel like this year it's all, all the range and essentially it's, um, like a digital token the same way that Bitcoin is a digital token, except it's completely unique. Um, it can be created from any art form. So why, what I mean by unique is like you can trade a Bitcoin for another Bitcoin and it's the same thing, right? Just like if I was like, Hey, um, I have $50. Can you, I change it for a $50 bill with you? You might be like, I don't get why you're doing that, but sure. It's an equal exchange. Whereas like, if I were to say, Hey, we both have the same iPhone. So why don't we just exchange iPhones? You'd probably be like, yeah, hell no. <laughs> we're not doing that. Cause it's really unique. Even though it's like, it looks the same. It's unique. It has properties that are really unique to it. So an NFT is fully unique. There's only one of it. Um, and it can be made from anything. If you think about like uh, coin, like art collections, coin collection, baseball cards, those are all unique and there's only one of them and they have value. So it's really the value that the community attributes to this. Um, and I'm trying to think of, um, and there's so much utility, there can be utility to an NFT. For example, artists can get better royalties, like from if they have a digitized art form in when it's exchanged and sold, they can get royalties back. It's easier to track like the movement of these different assets. But yeah, there's a lot of hype in the space. Some NFTs have utility, some don't. Um, I'm still learning a lot. And that's one thing too about this space. I would say if you're talking to anyone and they can claim to be an expert, that's BS. Like we're all learning. We're all new to the space. And yes, some have been in it longer than others, but there are no true like experts. Yeah. Okay. That makes yeah. sense for sure. Yeah. Thank you for breaking that down. Yeah. So to kind of wrap it up, cause we talked a lot about investing and all the different types of investing and things like that. If you could break it down sim- super simple for somebody and say, okay, they have their emergency fund set up and you know, once they take out their living expenses, should, is there a certain percentage or something that you recommend that people are investing each year? Like say somebody makes a hundred thousand dollars a year or something. Is there a certain formula that you have for, for people to figure out how much of their money they should be investing? Or is it just like as much as you can? I'm an advocate for as much as you can, as long as you have an investment plan, that's well diversified, right? Um, you're not just going in on like one asset or one NFT hype, some hype thing. So if you have your emergency account set up, you have like enough, you know, you're going to set aside for your cost of living every month and fun things to do like as much as you can to investing. Like that's how you see with the power of compounding interest. Um, I wrote an article about that that's accessible on our website, like wealth come into play. Okay. Amazing. That's hard for a lot of people to grasp. <laughs> I like, know. Oh, that's a I lot know. Like, like, <laughs> to put in. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. But start everybody... somewhere. Start small. You have to build the muscle. I would say. And once you see traction, you see the power of compounding, then you just want you want to start putting more in. 
Totally. Yeah, I know. Nick yeah. like breaks down with me the power of compounding with like the money yeah. all the time. He's like, well, by, by this time we'll be at this point. By this time we'll be at this point, you yeah. know? And yeah. it is exciting and it gets fun when you actually educate yourself about it, which is why everybody is going to go to Investera. But a little bit about my um, health and wellness philosophy, and obviously all of this is big part of our well-being because finance is a huge part of our well-being, which is why we're talking about it on the podcast more and more. But I have a question for you in terms of what does self-love mean to you? Because I think that self-love is, you know, really important when it comes to our health and wellness and really just putting ourselves first and learning how to do that. So I'd love to hear what it means to you. Mm. Self-love. Um, for me, I think it means pausing. It took many years to learn this. Pausing to tune in and ask myself, like, what do I feel Right now, I didn't know how to tune into my feelings for most of my life. I didn't even know like how to access them. So now it's like, what do I feel? What do I need? What do I need to do to tend to myself so that I can best show up for myself and others? Like I was so used to just running on empty, give, 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 give. And now it's like, it's okay. And it's not selfish to tune in and ask myself, like, what do I need and make sure I'm taking care of myself like you said, across all well-being areas, um, mental well-being, physical well-being, financial well-being, and just being cognizant of that. And, and yeah, like take really putting effort and time towards investing in myself. Yeah. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Joy, for being here. Can you tell everybody where to find you, where to find Investera, how they can get involved, all that good stuff? Our website is www.investera, I-N-V-E-S-T-E-R-A, like investing in new era, dot I-O. And um, our Instagram handle is at investera.io. And we would love to have you join. We're launching our community uh, next month, in fact. Um, we've been doing a bunch of MVP events, but we're formally launching next month. So we'd love to have your listeners check us out. Amazing. Great. So by the time this is live, actually, it will already be launched then because this will be coming out live. Yeah. Amazing. Great. Well, then we will include a link in the show notes for everybody to go join Investera. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Okay, everybody. I hope that you enjoyed that episode of the Purely Podcast. It was so wonderful to learn more about investing from Joy. And she really broke it down in really simple terms. As I mentioned, if you liked this episode and you haven't already listened to episode 42 with Danny Pastorella from 111, I highly recommend listening to that episode too. And if you guys like this topic of finance, I would love to hear from you because I do think it's a really important part of our well being that we should always be educating ourselves on to really just have that overall holistic wellness and taking care of ourselves in all areas and aspects of life. So if you enjoyed this episode of the show, and if you enjoy any episodes of the Purely Podcast, I would so appreciate it if you could rate, review, subscribe. We love hearing from you. And when you do, you are automatically entered to win a copy of my ebook, Leading with Love, which is five-star rated, as well as a one-on-one health coaching session with me. So without further ado, I will see you next Thursday. I hope you have an amazing weekend, an amazing rest of your day. And thanks for being here.